guys, so in this lesson, I'm hoping to take you through how to turn any song into a jazz song. So in this video, I'm going to take a really simple pop song and then gradually, step by step, jazz it up by applying a whole bunch of different concepts and techniques. So that hopefully by the end of this video, you too will be able to take any song whatsoever and make it sound jazzy. Now, I've already covered a lot of these concepts in past videos, so in a sense, this video is going to be a bit of a conglomeration of many of my past videos, um, but in this one, I'm going to essentially show you how you can put these um, concepts into practice. As well as that, there will be a lot of new information, especially about reharmonization. Now, there are various things you can do to make a song sound jazzy, and applying these sort of various techniques and concepts will give you varying degrees of jazziness. So in this lesson, the steps I'm going to take you through are extending the chord, altering the chord, adding passing chords, choosing appropriate voicings, reharmonization, and then embellishing the melody. Now, each of these techniques will give you a different level of jazziness. Um, from extending the chords, which will just give you a slightly jazzy sound, all the way through to reharmonizing the entire chord progression, which will give you a really, really jazzy, like serious jazzy sound. Now, reharmonization is just a fancy word for chord substitution, except that you're substituting an entire chord progression rather than just individual chords. Now, I have a completely separate video on chord substitution where I cover the most commonly used and well-known chord substitutions. So I'm not going to go over that here. Instead, I'm going to give you the general rule or the underlying theory so that you'll know why some chord substitutions work and why others don't. And that way, you'll be able to come up with your own chord substitutions instead of just for following sort of standard formulas like, um, you know, use a tritone substitution over a dominant 7 chord, which incidentally doesn't always work, and I'll explain why later. Now the song I'm going to be jazzing up is Let It Be by The Beatles. Now the reason I've chosen this song is that firstly it's a really simple four chord pop song all in a single key. The melody is quite melodic, which makes it more interesting when you reharmonize it. Um, it's well known and I like The Beatles. Now, I'm only going to be jazzing up the first eight bars of that song, otherwise this video would be way too long. Um, so if you have a look in the picture in picture now, you'll see I've written out the chord progression and the key melody note for each bar. Now, firstly notice that all the chords are just simple triads. And secondly, the key melody note, which is a term that I just came up with, um, but essentially it's just the most important note in each bar. The note that has the greatest amount of focus on it. The note that is harmonically the most integral to that bar. Now, this concept will become very, very important later on in the lesson, as you'll see. Now, choosing the key melody note for each bar is somewhat subjective, but generally the factors you'd look at to see whether a note is the key melody note of a bar or not are whether the note is the first note of the bar, generally the first note is more important than the later notes, whether the note is played on the beat or off the beat, again, notes played on the beat are generally more important than notes played off the beat, Notes that are longer in duration are generally more important than notes that are shorter, and notes that are repeated are generally more important than notes that are not repeated. Now, like I said, the key melody note is harmonically the most important note in the bar, and so you structure your harmony around that note, and in a sense you can treat all the other notes in that bar as passing notes. Um, so notes that are not really that important to the harmony of the song. Okay, so now let's play the regular simple pop version of Let It Be um, just with the triads and see how that sounds. So let's quickly just break down the melody so I can show you how I came up with the key melody notes of each bar. Now bar one sounds like this. 
higher. So we played G twice and G was the first note we played on beat one of the bar. So I decided that um, that is the key melody note. Whereas these ones are both played um, only once, they're not repeated. Then in bar two, Again, that G was played on beat one and repeated, whereas these two were not repeated, so I've decided that that's the key melody note. Now bar three. Right, so even though that D was the first note we played on beat one, the E is repeated and then sustained, so it's a longer note. Um, so I've decided that that's the key note of the melody. Now bar four. Right, so again, even though D was the first note we played on beat one, the C um, we repeat and it's a longer note. So I've decided that that's the key melody, no melody note of that bar. Um, and so you can see, I'm not going to go through the other four bars because you get the general idea, but you can see here I've written out what I think are the key melody notes for each bar. Now, so the first thing you can do to make a song slightly more jazzy is to turn all the triads you're playing into seventh chords. So then it'll sound something like this. So that's really, really simple, really basic. We've just turned all the triads into seventh chords by adding either a C major seven or a G dominant seven and A minor seven and so on, all in the key of C major. Um, and already it sounds a little bit jazzy, but not really all that jazzy. So now we can obviously take that further and extend the chords further with natural ninths, elevenths and thirteenths, and then choose the appropriate voicings for each chord. Now you can add ninths and thirteenths to major and dominant chords, but not elevenths. And you can add ninths and elevenths to minor chords, but not thirteenths. Now I'll go into a little bit more detail about why this is later on, but for the moment just accept that as sort of a fact. So now we can play something like this. So already that's sounding a little bit more jazzy just by adding those natural extensions and choosing appropriate chord voicings. Now up here in the picture in picture I've written out both the chords that I was using and the voicings for each of those chords. Now I've got a separate series of videos on different jazz chord voicings where I cover each of those. So if you, if you don't know some of them or you're, if you're interested in learning them, go check them out there. Now the next thing you can do to make your song a bit more jazzy is to alter the chord. Now the rule here is that you can alter any note except for the key melody note. That means you can alter the third or the seventh, which means you alter the quality of the chord, as long as the melody is not a third or a seventh. Now this is a very important rule and we're going to come back to this rule when I discuss re reharmonization. So let me give you an example of what it actually means. If we have the chord C major 7 and our key melody note is an E, you can change this C major 7 to a C dominant 7 or a C7 sharp 5 or a C7 flat 9 but you can't change it to a C minor 7 because that would mean changing the natural 3, the E, to a flattened 3rd, the E flat. Similarly, if we have a C major 7 and our key melody note is the G, we can change this chord to a C dominant 7 or a C minor 7, but we can't change it to a C minor 7 flat 5 because then we wouldn't have the natural 5th anymore, the G, we would have a G flat, the flattened 5th. Now using this idea we can now play our song again, again using the appropriate chord voicings, but altering some notes that are not the key melody note of each bar. So then it would sound something like this.
Right, so again, you can see the chords I played and the voicings I used just over here in the picture in picture. And so just breaking it down quickly for you, in bar, bar one, I played a C major nine sharp 11. So I sharpened the 11, the F, and that's fine because our key melody note is not an F, it's a G. In bar two, I played a G7 flat nine flat 13. And again, that's fine because our key melody note is the root, the G, not a 9 or a 13, which would then clash with the altered 9 and 13. Then I played a C uh, minor 9, which is fine, but then I changed the F major chord to a uh, F9 chord. And again, that's fine because our key melody note is a C, it's the 5th, so we're allowed to change the 7th and therefore change the quality of the chord. Um, because our key melody note is not the 7th, it is the 5th. Similarly, I could have just as easily played an F minor 9 or an F minor 7. Um, again, because our key melody note is the 5th, and the 5th is still the 5th in a F minor 7 chord. Then in bar 5, I played a C6-9 in place of a C major, which is a fine sort of substitute chord. Similarly, in bar 6, I played a G9 sus chord instead of a G major or a G7 chord, which is also a fine substitution. Um, and then for the little outro bit in bars 7 and 8, the where it goes... I played a um, F6-9 in a quartal voicing, but with a bass, um, with an F in the bass, and I just walked that down to a C6-9, um, which gives it a much more sort of jazzy feel. Cool, so the next thing you can do to make your song sound a bit more jazzy is to insert passing chords. Now, I've got a separate video on passing chords, so I'm not gonna go into them in depth here, but essentially they're just chords that you pass through which are not really important to the harmony of the song and for that reason um, it can be almost any chord you like but generally the most common passing chords are chromatic approach chords um, two fives or five ones so now just for simplicity's sake so you can follow along a bit easier um, i'm going to go back to playing seventh chords um, and i'm going to just play block chords but inserting passing chords into our little sort of jazzed up version of Let It Be can sound something like this. Passing chords are a good way to sort of jazz up a chord progression and make it sound like there's a bit more going on, there's a bit more uh, of an interesting harmony, whereas in reality you haven't really changed any of the chords, you've just added a couple extra little non-consequential or inconsequential um, passing chords. And so, of course, the idea is to mix all of those um, concepts or techniques together to sort of play extensions and alterations and passing chords, all with the appropriate chord voicings, and sort of put them in into one nice um, jazzy sounding song. Cool, so now we're on to reharmonization. Now this is where you make your song sound really jazzy and really nice and really smooth, essentially by replacing the entire chord progression with brand new chords. So as I said at the beginning, um, in this video I'm going to give you the general rules or the underlying theory as to why certain chords work as substitutions and certain chords don't work. And that way you can come up with your own chord substitutions. Now of course there are certain well-known and widely used chord substitutions such as the tritone substitution or the median note substitution or a 2-5 or a diminished substitution. But really, there's no guarantee that using one of these sort of well-known chord substitutions will actually work over a given song or a given melody. And by the end of this lesson, you'll understand why that is. Now, I should also say that reharmonization is a huge and complex topic, and you could probably do a three-hour lesson on it if you wanted to. 
Um, so I'm just going to be barely scraping the surface here and I'll make a few more videos in the future about reharmonization and I'll go into a bit more depth. But this will be a very good start um, for you to understand how it works, why it works and to put it into practice. Alright, so let's begin. Now the first thing you need to remember is that reharmonization depends entirely on the key melody note of each bar. Now hopefully you remember my earlier rule which stated that you can alter any note in a chord except for the key melody note and that included thirds and sevenths. Well, now if you take this to the logical extension, that also means that you can alter the root note of a chord and therefore change the tonality of the entire chord as long as the key melody note in that bar is not the root note. Now, in order to understand this properly, we need to discuss acceptable harmonies, which are also known as available tensions. Now, I'm only going to look at the three most common chords that is the major, the minor, and the dominant chord. But essentially all this means is that some extensions and alterations are considered acceptable, whereas others are not, because they are thought to ruin the quality or the consonants of the chord. So let's go through them. So let's start with the major chord, and let's play a C major 7. Now, if you are improvising or writing a melody over the chord C major 7, you generally wouldn't use the notes C or G. That's because these notes are considered harmonically weak. And that's because the notes C and G are found both in the C major 7, in the C minor 7, and in the C dominant 7. So these two notes aren't really adding anything to the quality of the chord. On the other hand, the 3rd and the 7th, which are known as the guide tones, are considered harmonically strong. And that's because they determine the quality of the chord. So you, if you had a major 3rd and a major 7th, this, this would make it a C major 7 chord. Whereas a minor 3rd, minor 7th makes it a minor chord, major 3rd, minor 7th makes it a dominant chord. So if you were writing a melody or improvising, you, and you wanted to create a harmonically strong melody or improvisation, you would generally avoid the root and the fifth and target the third and the seventh. So taking this further, over a major seven chord, the available tensions or the acceptable harmony uh, or the notes that create a jazzy and nice harmony are considered to be the ninth, the sharp eleventh and the th natural thirteenth. Whereas the notes that are considered to create an unacceptable harmony, that is, to create a harmony which clashes with the consonants of the major 7 chord, are the flat 9, sharp 9, natural 11, which is an avoid note, um, the flat 13, and the sharp 13. So that means if you were writing a melody or improvising, you could target the 9th, the sharp 11th, or the 13th, but you generally wouldn't target any of the flat 9, sharp 9, 11, flat 13, sharp 13, because that would, again, create an unacceptable harmony with the chord. Now, if we do the same exercise with the C minor 7 chord, again, we find that the 1 and the 5 are harmonically weak, the flat 3 and the flat 7 are harmonically strong. The available tensions or the acceptable harmonies are now the natural 9, natural 11, and natural 13. Though I should say, a lot of people consider the natural 13 to be an avoid note and therefore an unacceptable harmony. But for the purpose of symmetry, let's just say that the natural 13 over a C minor 7 chord is an acceptable harmony. Um, but really that's a bit of a subjective um, choice. And so the unacceptable harmonies over a C minor 7 chord would be the flat 9, flat 11, which is also the major 3rd, sharp 11, flat 13, and natural 7. So again, they're notes that you generally want to avoid. And again, if we do the same exercise with the C dominant 7, we find the 1 and the 5 are harmonically weak, the 3 and the flat 7 are harmonically strong. This time, the acceptable harmonies are the flat 9, 9, sharp 9, sharp 11, flat 13, 13. And the unacceptable harmonies are the natural 11, and which is an avoid note, and the natural 7. And incidentally, this is why you only very, very rarely see a C major 7 flat 9. That's not really a chord you're going to come across very often. 
or a C major 7 sharp 9 or a C minor 7 flat 9. So these unacceptable harmonies are not available tensions when you're building the chord and you generally want to avoid them if you're writing a melody or if you're improvising. Okay, so it's important that you understand this table. So now we're going to go on and we're going to do the same exercise but in reverse. Instead of taking a chord and finding all of its acceptable harmonies, let's take a single note and find all the chords where that note is an acceptable harmony. So as our note, let's take the note G. Now up here in the picture in picture, I have written out every single possible major, minor and dominant chord where G forms an acceptable harmony with that chord. So for example, over a C major 7, the G is the 5th, which is a weak harmony, and that's why you don't see a C major 7 up here in the picture in picture. Whereas the G is the 3rd of E flat major 7, which is a strong harmony, and that's why it's up here. Or for example, the G is the 9th of F major 9 which is again an acceptable harmony over a major chord and that's why you see the F major 9 up here. And so if you look closely at the table in the picture in picture, you'll notice a couple of really well known and commonly used chord substitution. For example, in this picture in picture, I've listed the chord D flat 7, which is a tritone substitution of G7. Similarly, I've listed the chords E minor 7 and A minor 7, which are both median note substitutions of C major 7. You can also see that I've listed a D minor 11, and that's the 2, which can then go to the 5 of G7. Now, I mentioned earlier that the common, well-known substitutions don't always work. For example, the tritone substitution doesn't always and forever work in every single song. And essentially, this table is why. For example, if we take the chord G7, now if our key melody note is a D flat, that is a sharp 11 from the point of view of the G7, which is an acceptable harmony. However, if we try to substitute this G7 to a D flat 7, keeping the same melody note, the melody note now becomes a root or a 1, which is a weak harmony. So in this particular circumstance, it's better to keep the G7 as it is and not to try to substitute it because if we do, we weaken the harmony. And so this table here, as I said before, lists every single major, minor and dominant chord where G is an acceptable harmony. Now, as you may remember, the key melody note of the first two bars of Let It Be is the G. And so if we take a look at the original chords in the first two bars, we find that the first chord is C major, where G is the fifth, a weak harmony. And the second chord is a G major, where the key melody note, the G, is a root. Again, a weak harmony. And that's what makes this song a pop song rather than a jazz song. To make it a jazz song, we need to pick chords that create more complex harmonies over this melody. So in the picture in picture, we have a list of all the possible chords that we can use when our key melody note is a G. And we can write a similar table for every single note in the chromatic scale. So now all we have to do to reharmonize the first two bars of the song Let It Be is to pick any two chords listed here. And you don't have to keep the original chord quality. That is, just because the song with the original chords starts on a major chord doesn't mean you need to start your reharmonization with a major chord. You can start it with a dominant or with a minor chord. So for example, you could start with an A minor 7 and then go to a D minor 11. Or you could start with an E7 and then go to an E flat major 7. Or you could
could start with an F major 7 and then go to a B flat 7. Right, you can play that melody because the key melody note of the first two bars um, is G. You can pick literally any two of these chords and reharmonize the first two bars. That is, substitute them in in place of the C and the G in the original chord progression. Now this obviously leads us to the next question, but which chords should I pick? And there are a couple of general rules that you can follow. So firstly, choose any chord where the key melody note is an acceptable harmony. So literally pick any of these chords at random, whichever one you like. Secondly, move to the next chord in a structured way. So our ears like structure. They, they associate structure with symmetry and beauty and pleasantness. What that effectively means is that the next chord you should move to should be moved to either chromatically, that is half a step away, diatonically, which for this, for the sake of this um, generalization, let's say that's a tone away, or through the cycle of fifths. So moving chromatically would be, for example, uh, moving from the E7 to the E flat major 7. Moving diatonically or moving by a whole step would, for example, be moving from the E minor 7 to the D minor 7. And moving through the cycle of fifths would, for example, be starting on the B7 and then moving to the E minor 7. Right, that's a 5, 1. And when we're moving either chromatically, diatonically, or through the cycle of fifths, we're only really paying attention to the movement of the bass note. The quality of the chord doesn't really matter as much. That is, you can move from a minor to a major, or a major to a minor. It's more the bass note um, that is important here, and that creates that sense of structure and roundedness. And then the last thing to keep in mind is that when you're picking chords, you should try to increase and then decrease the tension. So you increase the tension by picking further extended and altered chords like sharp 11s and flat 13s, and you re resolve or reduce the tension by going back to the third or the seventh or like a natural ninth, for example. And so you really want the tension to sort of wax and wane, ebb and flow. You want to build some tension and then resolve that tension. So it's very similar to jazz improvisation if you've seen my series on that. So again, taking the first two bars of Let It Be, um, if we play a B7, that G note, the key melody note, is a flat 13, which is a really dissonant, it's a high tension note. by um, moving it or resolving it to the E minor 7, the key melody note, the G, is a third, which is a low tension or a resolving note. So we effect effectively build up tension by choosing a B7 and a flat 13th, and then resolve it. So let's say I pick E flat major 7 as my first chord, and then D flat 7 as my second chord, which is a tritone substitution of the G7. Now they're a tone apart. So if I wanted to, I can connect them chromatically with a passing chord of D7. Now again, passing chords don't need to follow these rules because they're passing chords. They're not important to the harmony. So then if I take this idea and apply it to all eight bars of Let It Be, I can get something like this. you can see the chords I played up here in the picture in picture. And so now there's a couple things to note. Now in bar 4 I played an E flat diminished which is effectively a rootless B7 flat 9 which created a 5-1 relationship 
with the E minor 7 which I moved to in the next bar. Now secondly, I was just playing basic 7th chords in block position, or as block chords that time through the whole song, just so you could really hear the harmony. But in reality, if you were build it, building this up into a performance or a solo piece, you would also then add extensions, alterations, and pick appropriate chord voicings on top of those sort of bass chords. So that again adds another layer of complexity and you can sort of start this process all over again by doing all the earlier steps that I covered in this video. Another thing to note was that I wasn't playing on the beat, I wasn't playing in a fixed tempo, I was playing rubato in the classical world. And that's perfectly fine in a jazz solo piece, whereas pop songs generally need a pretty strong beat. If you're playing a solo song, so you're not relying on sort of other people or a drummer or anything like that, you can change the tempo and do whatever you like with the rhythm. Another point to note was that I broke my own rules. In bar 5 and 6, the key melody note is the root of the chord. So I played an E minor 7 and the key melody note was an E. Then I moved to the D minor 7 and the key melody note was a D. So even though I just told you that using root notes creates a weak harmony, that was okay in this case because even though it was harmonically weak, it was structurally strong. So effectively what that means is I was playing two fives, which is a, a very strong, sort of well-known, well-established bebop era um, chord progression. And in fact, I was actually tritone substituting the dominance, so I was playing. So um, not only did I have a 2-5 going on, I was moving down chromatically. So that created a really strong structural base, and if your structure is strong, it's not as terrible if your harmony is a bit weaker. So it, was, it actually sounded okay when I was playing the root notes. And the other thing I want to say is that you are allowed to break all of these rules. Do not take what I'm saying as gospel. They are just general rules to get you started, and then you can just play around with whatever you like and break any of the rules that I've, or generalizations that I've stated here. And now, of course, the next thing you can do to make this whole um, piece even more jazzy is to embellish the melody with various ornamentals, either with harmonies or trills or other little bits and pieces. Now, I've got a separate video on embellishing the melody, so go check that out if you like. But essentially, you could play something like this. So now that song is barely recognizable. If I just played that at the very beginning of the, this video, you probably wouldn't have guessed that that was Let It Be. But really, it's a, it's a rather jazzed up, reharmonized, embellished Let It Be. And so as a comparison, go back to the very start of this video and listen to the basic pop version and you'll really hear the difference. But wait, as always in jazz, there's more. Now, I've only covered the three most common chord types, that is the major, the minor, and the dominant. Now, there are many, many other chord forms and possibilities out there. For example, there's the minor 7 flat 5 chord, the dominant 7 sharp 5, the minor major 7 chord, the sus chord, the sus flat 9 chord, the minor flat 6 chord. Right, there are heaps of other chords out there that I haven't even looked at that you can incorporate into your reharmonization. Now, I'm not going to go through these in depth because we'll be here all night, but as a general rule, the root and the natural 5 are always a weak harmony, and the 3rd, the 7th, and any altered note are considered a strong harmony. So using those chords, you could play something like this. So you've now reached the end of this lesson. Congratulations, I'm impressed you made it this far. This was a bit of a monster lesson. 
But hopefully I've now shown you how you two can take any song whatsoever, whether it's a pop song or a classical song or a country song or whatever, and by using extensions and alterations and passing chords and different voicings and reharmonization and embellishment of the melody, by applying each of these things, you can create a jazzier version of a song. And not only that, you can create different levels or different degrees of jazziness, all the way up to the point where the song is almost barely recognizable anymore. And finally, I want to say a few more important things about reharmonization. Now, as I said earlier, this is just barely scraping the surface of what's possible with reharmonizations. Now, in this video, we've changed the chord in order to fit the melody. However, in more advanced and more complex reharmonizations, you can change the melody to fit the chord. And as I'm sure you can imagine, if you do this, then your options are almost limitless. This means you can literally pick any chord whatsoever. And if the melody note doesn't fit, that is, if the melody note is not an acceptable harmony, you can just change the melody note, either by sharpening it or flattening it or omitting it completely or playing something completely different. Now, this is often done when a musician favors the structure of the chord progression over the melody. And this can happen a lot with things like Coltrane changes, which I'll leave for another video because they're quite complex, um, or even a 2-5 cycle. So, for example, if you really, really liked 2-5s, you thought they were really strong harmonically and you really liked their sound, and so you wanted to change Let It Be into just a cycle of 2-5s. Then you could do something like this, play F sharp minor 7 to B7, E minor 7 to A7, D minor 7 to G7, and then resolve it to C major 7. Now the key melody note in bar 1 is G, which is not an acceptable harmony over the F sharp minor 7. It creates a flat 9, which is not allowed over a minor 7 chord. So instead, we could just sharpen the melody to a natural 9, to a G sharp. So then you could have something like this. So that's just a really, really simple example of what I just mentioned. Changing the melody to fit the chords, because you've got a certain structure that you want to adhere to. And one last point on acceptable harmonies. The acceptable harmonies I've mentioned throughout this video are what are currently acceptable. But what is acceptable changes over time. For example, in the Middle Ages, the tritone was the Diabla sin musica, um, and so never played, whereas now it's a really, really commonly um, played interval, and in fact it's the, the foundation of the dominant 7 chord. It's the thing that makes it a dominant 7 chord. So my point is, don't be afraid to use some unacceptable harmonies and just see how it sounds. This is how music evolves. In fact, all of music history, from the creation of music hundreds of thousands of years ago to today, can be explained by humanity moving towards more and more dissonant intervals. Or, more technically, um, by humanity moving higher and higher up the overtone series. And on that philosophical note, goodbye. Thanks for watching, well done for getting to the end. Um, as always, feel free to leave any questions or comments if any of that didn't make sense. See ya!